Today, our speaker will be Dr. Thomas Haig, a historian and professor at the uh, School of Information Studies at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, and also a visiting faculty of the University of Siegen in Germany. Uh, Dr. Haig is one of the leading historians of computing today. He has published very prolifically and extensively in such journals as Communications of the ACM and the IEEE Annals of the History of Computing. He's written about a range of topics, including the history of word processing, database management systems, email, web browsers, personal computing, web portals, search engines, gender and data processing, software as a package, computing in Mexico, and the list goes on and on. <laughs> He's also edited a book, uh, a, a collection um, honoring uh, a collection of uh, articles uh, uh, written by the late historian Michael Mahoney, um, published by Harvard University Press. In addition to this research and, and his teaching, Dr. Haig has been a tireless leader and organizer of the community of, of historians of computing. Um, in, from 2005 to 2014, he was the chair of SIGSIS, the Special Interest Group on Computers, Information, and Society of the Society for the History of Technology. And it was in this capacity that I first met him as a graduate student, and I, ha I thank him for his help in my paper submissions and getting me travel grant money to go to the conference. Today, we'll be discussing his most recent work, his new book co-authored with Mark Priestley and Crispin Rope, titled ENIAC in Action, Making and Remaking the Modern Computer. This book broadens the history of the ENIAC beyond just its design and construction to its entire lifetime of use making scientific calculations. One particular focus of the book uh, is on the conversion of the ENIAC from its original programming method with patch cables to a new method, storing programs in memory, the way that programs, that computers work today. And that one of the first programs that was done in this new method were the Monte Carlo simulations of nuclear explosions. So this is very exciting for us at the Computer History Museum in particular because, as you know, we have several pieces of the ENIAC downstairs in our Revolutions exhibit. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Thomas Haig. <laughs> Well, uh, thanks, Hansen, for that uh, generous introduction. Uh, I'm so happy to be here. Um, it's been, you know, wonderful over the years uh, seeing the museum, um, you know, develop, uh, mature, the uh, introduction of the uh, permanent exhibit and so on. So for all of you who've contributed um, to the development of the museum, then, uh, you know, my congratulations. Um, yeah, so the title, Working on ENIAC, uh, The Lost Labors of the Information Age. So in the book, we really look at many different aspects of computing history around ENIAC. There's some very technical discussion there of um, the invention of conditional branching, the development of computer architecture, et cetera. Um, but we also try and you know, look not just at the hardware itself and at the architectural innovations, but at all the different kinds of work you know, that go into this kind of innovation. And so in this talk, I'll be highlighting uh, that kind of labor aspect of the story. Um, so this research, uh, I should first acknowledge uh, the support we received from Mrs. L.D. Rope's second and third charitable trusts. Um, that really uh, let us do an enormous amount of archival work. Um, good. Uh, and uh, employ the services of a number of assistants, so we're also very grateful to them. Now, to begin with, I should just say a few words, kind of summing up the conventional and popular history of computing in the 1940s, right? Basically, how these early machines have so far been understood and written about. So, there's the lone genius view of history, right? Uh, and, and that's the kind of story that journalists and popular writers generally want to tell about any technology. If you want to sell the public a book about an innovation, it probably needs to be a book about the lone genius who did something or other. Uh, for example, we see this recently and most strikingly in the film The Imitation Game, uh, 
um, with Alan Turing here basically played very much as Sherlock Holmes or, or Doctor Strange, right? A kind of inhuman genius with amazing powers and also weird kind of personal flaws who has to overcome those flaws to save the world. Um, and you get the lone genius idea summed up very nicely in this genuine line from the film as he's introduced to the other Bletchley Park code breakers. I don't have time to explain myself as I go along and I'm afraid these men will only slow me down, right? Because he's got a world to save. Um, in the film, he hand builds this thing called Christopher, right? And in my forthcoming communications of the ACM column um, called uh, Colossal Genius, I kind of discuss some of the gulf between this idea that Turing is building something with his bare hands and the reality that, in fact, the code breaking machine, the bombs that were used to break Enigma, were designed and built by an engineering company. And, you know, so it's a story about procurement management and contracts, et cetera, uh, rather than a lone genius. Um, now, and I, I know Walter Isaacson has been here. Uh, I'll try not to be too nasty. Um, so I've got to say, like, I can honestly say there are, there are many good things about his book, right? Certainly compared to some other kinds of, of popular understanding. Right? He stresses teamwork. The writing is lively. There's a bunch of footnotes. He cites real scholarly history. It goes back before the 70s. It's not like the history of computing starts with the Altair or something. And you know, he's come out in something which I think today you know, we all need to keep stressing, which is the role of liberal arts and you know, human understanding in, in technological innovation. But as a historian, I have to disagree with some of his basic assumptions, starting out with the title. Right? How a group of hackers, geniuses, and geeks created the digital revolution. So you basically have these kind of strange genius people who are the geniuses, the hackers, and the geeks. Now, to just see like, quite how you know, much this is shaping the popular understanding, uh, earlier in the year I went to Amazon, and I checked the computer industry and history section. So in the top 10, <laughs> there were four editions of the jobs biography and three editions of Innovators. That's seven of the top 10. And, and my joke is that the, the Braille edition of the Steve Jobs biography is probably outsold the Eniaki in action by an order of magnitude. So if, if we think about this view of history, right, on the one hand, yes, he says, no one person invented the computer. You know, it was a teamwork over time by different innovators. On the other hand, the people doing the innovating, there's still this stress on individual geniuses and geeks. You know, and it, I thought, what did that remind me of? <laughs> and the answer, of course, is the Avengers. So they have their own movies, but then every few years, they all have to come together and save the world uh, by working as a team. And if you're, I, I kind of mashed that up in another one of my communications of the ACM columns, Innovators Assemble, Ada Lovelace, Walter Isaacson, and the Superheroines of Computing. And this is going to be like a story of ENIAC that doesn't have any superheroes in. Now, the other thing, as well as lone genius superheroes that's in the popular understanding is is firsts, right? So if you ever go online when there's an article written about computing in the 40s, or you look at the Amazon reviews, the people who come out of hiding in the comments section basically only care about, did you get the right answer to the question, who invented the computer, right? So these kind of teams of partisans cheering on their man. And if you look at some of the books and things that have been written about early computing, the stress is very much on who had the first computer. So this book says it was Atanasov. This book says it was ENIAC. This guy says it was Alan Turing. Um, so it's really been kind of this group of people yelling at each other about who invented the computer. And I'm sure this obviously is a question the museum has had to kind of step around very delicately. Um, so ENIAC is remembered basically as one of these great machines, as one of the contenders for the title of first computer. Now, just to kind of quickly give you the chron chronology and the life story, right? So it's a wartime machine, proposed and approved in 1943. Detailed planning and prototype work in 44, main construction and debugging in 45. During 1946, it's operated on an experimental basis at the Moore School of the University of Pennsylvania, which is where it was constructed. In 1947, it's reassembled and brought back to life at the Ballistics Research Laboratory, an army facility in Maryland. From 48 to 54, it receives intensive use there. And in 1955, it's decommissioned, it goes into storage, it finishes up at the Smithsonian, and a part of it makes its way downstairs here. And ENIAC has kind of, now, this tree, which you may have seen, 
if you do computer history, what you might not realize it's actually drawn by the Bibliotics Research Laboratory. So they've got a certain kind of interest in presenting history this way. But that's typical of how ENIAC is often seen, right? If you're looking for ENIAC, it's that thing at the bottom there, at the base of the tree. So this idea that all of the rest of computing is in that sense growing out from ENIAC. This is a kind of more sophisticated version of that from Arthur Burks. And so those arguments about the first computer, right? How historians manage to deal with that is by basically saying, um, we're going to send everybody home with a prize so you can stop arguing. So what we did is stick adjectives between the word first and the word computer. So ENIAC got first electronic digital general purpose computer. And as such, it's been remembered as this kind of crucial step on the path to the first stored program computer. So what Berks' diagram is showing is that various innovations are brought together for the first time in ENIAC that then gets added to it uh, a large memory and modern computer architecture, and that's what gives rise to you know, the computer as we know it. Which reminds me of kind of the way this guy's been seen in history, right? Um, poor John the Baptist. So he has an important part in the story, but he's, um, his role in the narrative is understood as preparing the way for something else. In the same kind of way, we've cared about ENIAC in as much as it's a point of passage on the way to you know, the real computer. We haven't so much looked at ENIAC as something that had a life of its own and was actually used to do things with. So putting all that together, conventional computer history in this period has been obsessed with firsts. It's reduced each computer to a single date of first operation, right? in the case of ENIAC 1945. Uh, it can, it's basically centered on a story of progress in architectural innovations. It's considered very little about what computers were actually used for. And if you consider that people build computers in order to do things, that clearly leaves out a lot of computing history. And you know, hence the title ENIAC in action, right? Looking particularly at how it was used. So to go through some of the story here, building ENIAC, we've got several chapters on this. As I mentioned, it's done at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, the Moore School of Electrical Engineering was founded in 1923. Now, you, you probably, you know, understandably have a kind of Silicon Valley view of the world. What you might not know is back in the 40s, the Pennsylvania, New Jersey area was the center of the electronics industry, uh, radio production, vacuum tubes, and the Moore School had strong ties with the local electronics industry. It also had experience with computing. It had previously partnered with BRL to build a mechanical differential analyzer. Uh, I think you've got a differential analyzer here as well, uh, to carry out hand compute, uh, and to carry out hand computations. Uh, it was a kind of smallish school, certainly not nearly as large or prestigious as MIT was at that point. The people whose names traditionally get you know, put on the plaque for ENIAC are John W. Morkley and J. Press Brecker. Morkley, a physicist who'd graduated in the middle of the Great Depression and um, found an kind of unsatisfying job teaching, uh, was looking to get into electronics on a wartime training program. J. Press Brecker had recently graduated um, and was a star student. He'd been recruited to help in a laboratory that they were staffing up for different wartime projects. The sponsor of the Ordnance Department, um, and so the Ballistics Research Laboratory was part of the Aberdeen Proving Ground, which was where they would test, one of the things they did there was test fire shells, which sounds kind of low tech, but it was actually a, a real pioneer in terms of the federal government supporting high-end science, but in this kind of applied area. Um, what they needed to produce, right, World War II. So the guns that they were manufacturing and delivering to Europe came with firing tables. So, you know, I mean, I, I don't know anything about guns. So I think of a gun as something you kind of point and you line up the sights and then you pull the trigger, right? So that's, that's snipers, basically. But most of the deaths on both sides in World War II, you know, came from um, mortars and shells, you know, munitions. And with that kind of gun, you point it towards the target, but you have to decide how far up in the air you want to go. And if you've played Angry Birds, you're really familiar with the mathematics that's at work there. So they need a table that tells them if you want the shell to go a certain distance with particular wind conditions, temperatures, and the other parameters, what angle do you have to set the gun at? And the problem was that they couldn't do the calculations fast enough to make the firing table, so they were sending the guns out without them. Uh, ENIAC was justified as a machine that would speed up those calculations and get the firing tables produced. Um, so it was, although it could do many things, it was sold on the basis of one particular job. 
Now, the engineering team, if you look kind of in the small print of computing history, you can find these names. Um, so these were the design and production engineers who built the machine. And that's another kind of work that goes along with it. But in the book, kind of we look more broadly. So the dean of the Moore School, for example, um, turned out to play an important role in the project. So did the draftswoman who was brought on early, the project secretary, um, John Grist Brain, at a lesser known name, the project director. Uh, we found in the archives evidence, for example, that uh, numerical methods expert Hans uh, Rademacher was uh, intimately involved in figuring out how much precision they needed. So how many digits they needed to have in the machine's accumulators to carry out those firing table computations to an acceptable degree of accuracy. On the customer side at BRL, we saw evidence that the machine was strongly shaped, as you would expect, by working with the users to figure out what their needs were. Um, so Herman Goldstein, who was officially working for BRL overseeing the project, really became a core part of the project team and was very much involved in, in making the thing work. Um, and his boss and Leland Cunningham, the head of the machine computation group there, and two of the mathematical would-be users, uh, were also, we saw, very much involved in shaping the machine. Uh, there's this kind of myth in popular ENIAC history that it was built with very little thought about how the application would work and that they just threw it together the day before the demo, which is just completely not true. Um, and we see here, uh, so this was an original 1943 proposal. And early on in the project, within a few months of the start of work, they already had sketched out a sample setup for how the machine would carry out those trajectory computations. So rather than just thinking about this the day before the demo, they thought about it very early on in the project, and it fundamentally shaped how the machine was built. Now, it finished up with a rather unique and interesting kind of architecture. Um, so you see here, ENIAC basically formed a room that people stood inside, right? So people didn't just work on ENIAC, they worked in ENIAC. And in fact, uh, later on in the project, when it was the only thing that was air conditioned at BRL, people who had nothing to do directly with ENIAC would try and move their desks inside <laughs> during the summers um, to carry on their work there because there was a little bit of spare space. So essentially, ENIAC formed a set of wall dividers. There was an interior space. You always see the picture of the interior space, but all around the outside uh, were the vacuum tubes accessible for servicing work. And how it was configured was also a unique kind of system. Um, it's been said that you basically wired a special purpose machine to carry out the job that you needed. So in that sense, ENIAC was kind of almost like a kit of parts, like those old Radio Shack electronic kits where you would run wires between the different terminals to set up the circuit that you actually wanted. You had a kit of computational parts, and you would wire ad hoc um, data and program control buses between them so that when one unit had finished its operation, it would kick out a pulse, and the wire would take it to the unit that needed to do the next operation. It also had a heavy degree of parallelism. If you look at the tech specs of it, um, so it cost about half a million dollars plus delivery and setup, which was up from an original budget of about $150,000. Um, it filled about 2,000 square feet, weighed about 30 tons, uh, used about 150 kilowatts of power, which I understand is kind of in line with a kind of incremental chunk of modern data center capability. But it was rather less powerful. It had 200 decimal digits of writable memory, 4,000 decimal digits, essentially, of programmable read-only memory. And it could do 300 multiplications a second. People often quote additions, but for this kind of computation, it's really the multiplications that are the crucial thing. Uh, it was built in a modular kind of way. So each decimal digit was a plug-in module. And this is a single decimal digit, 23 vacuum tubes. Uh, now, I've held one of these. This picture is often tweeted out by a spam account that claims it's the women of ENIAC. And it isn't. What this actually is is from the early 60s, by which point BRL had gone through a number of generations of computer technology. So, this lady is holding a digit of ENIAC memory, and the other three are holding the subsequent generations of computers that were installed there. So see, a single digit had by that point shrunk down to just that size. Um, 
So the point that they're making there is something that you see. So in the last chapter of the book, we talk about how the way ENIAC has been seen has changed over time. And the interesting thing was, within just a few years of it being decommissioned, it was a symbol of how slow and expensive and heavy computer technology used to be, because you always can make a later computer. You'd say, well, you know, it's 10 times more powerful than ENIAC and 100 times smaller and 1,000 times cheaper. It kind of becomes a yardstick for technological progress. And that's how it's working in this picture. What you take away from it is, wow, that ENIAC digit is really big and heavy. And I've held one of those, and she's kind of doing well to smile while she's carrying it. Um, now, people have talked a lot about ENIAC as a revolutionary machine because it used an extremely large number of vacuum tubes, about 18,000. And that's certainly true. But when we dug in the archives, what we found was that wasn't really the only technology that was challenging, right? It's not that ENIAC was just a heap of vacuum tubes. So right at the beginning, what we see here, here is in order to carry digital pulses well over miles of wire inside the machinery, they were worrying about what kind of wire they needed to use. And engineers from the team went up to MIT and saw another project which had got some wire that seemed like it would do the job well. But unfortunately, nobody there could remember where it had come from. So they took back a length of wire. This wire is still in the archives pinned to the letter. And cut it into small pieces and mailed it to potential suppliers asking, basically, do you recognize this wire and can you make some? Um, as well as the wire, the, we talk about the problem of resistors. So they needed some resistors with very special characteristics, which were only made by one company. And during the war, this is kind of where my business history kind of side comes in. I was digging into how the procurement worked. So the government basically rationed high-tech things and assigned different projects a priority code. And you had to have a sufficiently high priority code to get the electronic equipment that you needed. So the team was negotiating with the government um, procurement bureaucrat trying to explain, no, we need these special resistors, which it wasn't going very well. Fortunately, it turned out that the dean of the Moore School was the founder of the company that made the special resistors. And it seems from some oral histories like they managed to you know, maneuver a little bit outside the completely official channels to get what they needed there. Uh, we have a story about the custom power supplies there. So I, I think maybe they could have engineered it a tiny bit better if they had more time. They finished up needing 78 different voltage levels, <laughs> which were produced by 28 different custom-made power supplies. Um, they wanted to get them from GE, but GE had a big backlog. So they finished up ordering them from a fly-by-night company that was in basically a startup in the electronics area. Um, the guy who had bought up the rights to the Tommy gun was doing very well <laughs> during the war and uh, was trying to diversify. He was later well-known as a white supremacist. And uh, so they placed the order with his electronics company, which just failed miserably to deliver and, and kept falling short. So, I mean, they were worried that the entire project might fail because they couldn't get the power supplies that they needed. That was on the critical path to having a machine that they could test and deliver. So, you know, kind of we dug into all these different kinds of materialities and, and the actual engineering that's involved that goes way beyond just thinking of the computer as a particular architectural innovation. Um, we also looked at the physical construction. So you read kind of most histories, and they don't give you kind of any sense that building a computer is a different job from designing it. Um, but really, it was. So in 1944, as they shifted from the design work into the production phase, basically, they were kind of running you know, a reasonably large little kind of startup manufacturing company inside the Moore School to build the thing. So they finished up splitting into the engineering and test team, the seven design engineers that you may have heard of, uh, the mechanical design and drafting team, the model making team, and the production team. And they came up with a formal process of sign off and approvals to get each step, you know, each design to go from one team to the next team and be approved so they wouldn't rush things into production before they were confident that they had the thing right. Now, the production team was already the majority of people on the project. In fact, maybe the majority of the people in the Moore School at that point. Uh, 34 full-time equivalent workers already by the end of 1944. Now, the interesting thing is, there's this kind of story about ENIAC uh, that I'll talk about. The idea is men built it, women programmed it. And you know what? It turns out, actually, women built it. So this, is, again, is my business history side. I was digging into the accounting records. And we see accounting and personnel records show payments to people called wiremen, technicians, and assemblers. 
And sometimes the printout would give you, um, when they paid the salary, would give you the names and amounts of the people who were being paid. And then we kind of zoomed in um, on those, and you know, we're looking at those kinds of names there. And you kind of look, you see names like Marjorie and Ruth and so on, people you've never heard of, not the famous ENIAC women, they, they were hired later. So it turns out we can identify about 50 women working on the ENIAC project in 1944, building the thing, again, before those famous women of ENIAC uh, were hired. And, you know, there's a saying that computing history, you know, just reduces the work of women to a footnote. In this case, actually being able to identify them and put them in a footnote was a big upgrade from having been completely forgotten. So if you buy the book, you'll get that footnote. Um, now, I'd mentioned Herman Goldstein, and uh, one of the things he was doing there was uh, spinning the progress of the project to sponsors. So I know, I'm sure a lot of you have been involved in project management and can identify with this. So by the end of 1944, it was clear that the end of the war was approaching. And the government had actually got language in all the contracts that let them immediately cancel a contract if the, if the thing being built was no longer needed for the war. And in many cases, that language was exercised. So they had a kind of a legitimate uh, right to be concerned that the machine was not going to be ready in time to make these firing tables that um, were needed for the war in Europe. So if you look at the kind of progress reports, so our baseline is May 1944. Goldstein was promising completion by October 1st. In August, he said it was going to be virtually completed by the end of 1944. In September 1944, things were continuing to go really well, and they were onto the fairways. And by December, they were in the throes of completing the production of ENIAC within the next two months. Everything continued to go really well. So by May 1945, they were on the home stretch, and they hoped to start testing in about two weeks from now. And in fact, they start the, they do unit testing, but they hook the whole machine up and try, start trying to use it for the first time in November 1945. Um, by February, the thing really is ready and working. Uh, they have a big party on 15th February. Um, these are uh, some of the kind of military officers, um, Eckert and Morkley, Goldstein. Uh, we found the menu for the celebration dinner uh, in the archives. And, uh, you know, for wartime, I think it was a pretty good spread. They had lobster bisque, uh, filet mignon or broiled salmon steak, uh, au gratin potatoes. And uh, for dessert, there were fancy cakes, <laughs> cheese, and ice cream. Uh, I think they wanted to get uh, Eisenhower <laughs> for the speaker. Uh, they finished up with the president of the National Academy of Sciences and the chief of R&D for the Ordnance Department. And they also did a great job publicizing the thing. So one of the things Goldstein was laying the framework for was cultivating contacts in the press. And people get confused about the actual launch date. So they did an, because it was on the front page of the New York Times, 15th February, right? So they unveiled it in the evening. It was already on the front page of the newspaper that morning. So a lot of people think that it must have been unveiled on the 14th. But what they actually did was have an earlier press-only demo on February 1st, giving the journalists time to write the story under embargo and get the front page ready. Electronic computer flashes answers may speed engineering. Um, you're going to say, like, actually, uh, it was a pretty good call from the Times realizing that this deserved a place on the front page. All right, so having built the thing, obviously it needs to be operated. Now, this is where the famous women of ENIAC that you have heard of come in. So they were hired in the summer of 1945 when it became apparent that there really was about to be a computer ready to be operated. All of them had previously been computing the trajectories manually, right? So the logic there was, these are smart women. They already know how to do this computation job with a differential analyzer or by hand or with a desk calculator. They can transfer that expertise over into supervising the machine doing it. Um, and they worked through 1945 during the, um, well, no, they were trained late 45, and they worked basically from November 1945 for a year while the machine was operated at the Moore School. Some of them went with the machine to Aberdeen, which was the idea that they'd be providing the machine with some trained operators. So their duties included configuring and wiring units from paper plans, helping to diagnose and correct problems while the machine was in operation, feeding the punch cards in and out of ENIAC, which was a huge job. I'll talk more about that in a second. 
working the punch card machine equipment that was in there in the room with it, um, and it was needed as part of every ENIAC job, and working with the scientific users who maybe understood the mathematics and the physics, but not how ENIAC was configured, to help design ENIAC setups. Now, in terms of operation, actually, in some ways, the machine was quite forward-thinking in terms of debugging. So it had this little unit here, which is like a 1970s wired TV remote control unit that could start and stop the computer. And it could be set to go in a single step mode for debugging purposes. This actually appears to be where the term breakpoint comes from, because if you wanted to stop the program at a certain point, you just removed the wire that would take the output from it and fire the operation in the next machine. If you take that wire out, it stops. And I think that's the literal meaning of a breakpoint. Uh, and you could dial the clock speed right down and watch it in slow motion to see what it was doing. Now, the punch card machines that went there, so punch card machines had been around um, since uh, the, the 1880s, basically. Uh, the machinery had kind of been developing. So by the 40s, this was kind of off-the-shelf IBM equipment. That's basically where IBM comes from before it was in the computer industry. It dominated the punch card industry. And to do a job with a punch card machine, you didn't exactly program them. You had units that did particular tasks, sorting cards, collating cards, punching cards, tabulating cards together to produce output. And the human operators would configure the machines, and then during the course of a job, they'd move the machines, move the cards from one machine to another. And that series of operations would add up to what we think of as being a computer program. So it's a mixture of machine and human tasks. And ENIAC actually is used in very much the same way which is something we found was interesting. You'd think that with a computer, you basically turn it on, push a button, and the answer comes out. But that's not at all how it's used for the bigger jobs. So we've got, uh, this is pictures of two of the operators using the punch card input and output devices. So this is a chart that we have in the book for the Monte Carlo computations that were run in 1948. And you see here, these tasks inside the box, those are the parts of the job that ENIAC is doing. But the important thing for our purposes here is that then it's followed by these manual operations done by the operators and with conventional punch card machines to get the cards ready to simulate the next instant in the lifespan of an exploding nuclear weapon. So it remains kind of a mixture of human labor that's inextricably intertwined with these automatic computing steps. This is maybe the most complicated job run on ENIAC in 1950. Uh, the first numerical weather forecast ever conducted. And the chart here is summarizing the different steps. So each ENIAC operation in this column is followed by punch card output and then manual punch card elaborate operations to kind of sort the decks um, and hand massage the data and get it ready for the next computerized step. So running the complete simulation took 24 hours. Um, and most of that time was spent doing things with punch cards. Now, ENIAC also, you know, was this kind of material workspace. So, I mean, even today, right, there's a lot of materiality in computing, network cables, heating and computing systems, running a data center, that kind of thing that, it, that you know, is kind of not really part of public awareness. And in a sense, ENIAC is where that's starting, right? It's the first purpose-built data processing center. So at the Moore School, where they just shoved it into an existing room, conditions were not good at all. Uh, we found in the computer logbook, right, so December 25th, Christmas Day, Morkley went home at 3 a.m. after flood from uh, snow melting was impinging on ENIAC, leaving five men still working, mopping up water and emptying buckets which catch drips. Prior to that, the machine had caught fire. So... If you read in the popular history of ENIAC, one thing that people tend to do is say, well, the army was really stupid because they insisted on turning it off at night um, because they were worried it might catch fire. Um, and that did turn out to be a mistake, but it wasn't quite as groundless as I'd assumed because then I found, oh, yeah, it actually really did catch fire when they left it unattended overnight at the Moore School, and maybe the army was worried about that happening again. Fortunately, they had engineered some cutoff circuits on the air blowers that cooled it, so when the temperature spiked, those fans cut off. And instead of fanning the fire through the entire machine, there was just one panel that was damaged, and they were able to uh, get it patched up again. 
Uh, the move to Aberdeen, I mean, looking through the records, we also saw, I kind of always vaguely imagined that maybe military trucks, you know, with camouflage pulled up in front of the Moore School and soldiers carted it out. But it turned out that like a lot of these other things, it was done with uh, subcontracts to local civilian companies. So they did the usual thing of hiring a moving company, getting a bill of lading. Uh, the most exciting part was that they had to knock a hole in the wall to winch the pieces out through because they were kind of too big and heavy to get out through the doors and stairs and it was moved down to Aberdeen. And this is some of the other material we found there. So the equipment installation plan. This is the side of ENIAC that you don't see, by the way. Uh, somebody here has removed a plug-in module of vacuum tubes and is testing it in the test rack. Uh, plans for the ventilation system. Uh, plans for the test room where they would um, figure out which tube had blown while the machine was in operation and fix the plug-in unit. The electric service plan. All right, this was using a lot of power. They had to get new electric service put in. Um, even the suspended ceiling. So this is something we take for granted now, but it was a, a kind of new, unfamiliar idea there to have a raised floor and a suspended ceiling and have all the cabling and things kind of be hidden away there. Um, it had been proposed in the early planning, but they went backwards and forwards on it. And the army only finally signed off on it in June 1947. Uh, a year and a half after ENIAC arrived there, when they realized what value it would have as a showpiece installation. Um, even looking at the archives back in, uh, during wartime, even before the machine was finished, there were enough people, and this is when it was supposed to be secret, but it wasn't very secret. So, you know, compared to the Manhattan Project, you know, it was really an open secret within this kind of world of people working on wartime projects. So there were enough people wanted to come and visit that the Pentagon actually wrote and said, you know, we're not thrilled about how long this is taking. Don't show any more people around until it's finished, because they worried that they were being distracted. Uh, this is maybe the most famous visitor um, to BRL to see it, President Truman. So we kind of see from the logbook that delegations were visiting, you know, several times a week to marvel at ENIAC there. Uh, on the other hand, it really took a while to get into its stride as a useful computing machine after its move. So in December 1947, the Times ran another story on it. And this time they were reporting that it was achieving only two hours of useful production work in a week. Um, some of the time, 17%, they were testing it and setting it up. But 49% of the time, they were checking, diagnosing, and fixing the hardware. Right? It was incredibly unreliable. And we saw an example of this from the logbook. Um, in early 1948. So a guy called Frank Grubbs, a PhD student at the, um, I think the University of Michigan, who uh, had been coming to wartime work for BRL. So he hadn't finished his thesis. And it kind of worked out nicely, because for his PhD thesis, he finished up doing work on statistical tests for outliers that related to BRL's wartime needs. And he was able to get three weeks of computer time for his thesis work on the world's only functional digital programmable computer. But functional turned out to be a slight stretch. So looking at the logbook entries for this, we saw that before the first useful output was produced, they spent three weeks on this one job before they got a single useful piece of output. And the range of problems that they faced was just stunning. They were intermittents, you know, electrical problems that would surface corrupt something, but they couldn't pin them down. The power supplies were dumping out. They, when they did get it working, they discovered an error in the mathematical treatment that meant that the um, rounding errors were just compounding, and the results became useless. Uh, they had to stop working for hardware upgrades. Um, when they did finally manage to get some output that looked good, the next thing they did very smartly was try and reproduce it. Same input, different output. <laughs> um, there was one particular week, uh, this is the entry here, we found in the logbook, where then they wasted almost a whole day getting ready for the Secretary of the Army to visit, and then they heard at lunchtime that he wasn't coming after all. Um, so one of the kind of heroes of the story that we, uh, we kind of uncovered is we did this with a guy called Homer Spence. So he'd originally was a radar technician um, enlisted in the Army who'd been sent because they needed somebody, uh, they needed two people, in fact, who could work with electronics uh, and do the maintenance. But he returned to BRL after he was discharged as a civilian employee and was there for almost the whole of the machine's useful lifespan. And according to a deposition in a court case later, um, he detected so many cold solder joints that he simply went through and resoldered every joint on the machine eventually. All right, that's about half a million joints. Um, and we see in kind of little things like that, you know, 
improvements in the expertise of the maintenance staff, fixing the bad joints, getting more accustomed with the machine, right? So I said before, when people think of ENIAC, it's usually with a particular date, right? 1945, the date it first works. But what we see here is, even by 1948, it was work, doing useful work something like a quarter of the time. And on the other hand, when it peaks up here, so it's rising to almost 70% here and about 70% there. So getting the machine you know, from this kind of unfamiliar, you know, potential white elephant um, thing into something that is actually kind of useful and practical, you know, it's not something that happens in days or weeks. It's a process of years. And it's inextricably bound up with this work of maintenance and operations and tacit knowledge you know, in the building of institutional capabilities. Oh, okay, yeah, remaking ENIAC. Now, the book's title, uh, Making and Remaking the Modern Computer. So, we also see ENIAC kind of changed in many ways during use. That's another reason why I think it's misleading just to think of it as a machine with a single date on it. Um, one of the interesting things we dug up, so Gene Bartik, uh, right, uh, Computer History Museum Fellow, um, the best known of that group of original operators. Um, what is not so well known is that in March 1947, so BRL issued a contract to the Moore School. She was hired back under that contract. So the operators had always been working for BRL, even when they were physically at the Moore School. But she didn't want to move away. So um, after the machine moved out, she was given a contract to set up and lead what seems to be the first group of people anywhere in the world who were hired specifically to do programming. Right? I mean, before, you know, the women had been hired to operate, and they did some programming work. At Harvard, um, Grace Hopper was kind of running the computer center and did some programming work. So people had done what we think of as programming, you know, but with other tasks as well. This seems to be the first time that anyone is hired specifically and exclusively to do programming work. And they worked on a number of applications and also on something called the converter code, which I'll define in a second. Um, ENIAC also, and this was not so well known, was one of the first machines operational with core memory. So its biggest handicap was that very small capacity of 200 decimal digits of vacuum tube memory. In 1947, um, they ordered a delay line memory that would have expanded that. It was delivered a little later, but it never worked properly. And, and was never used. Uh, but Burroughs Corporation delivered one of the first pieces of production core memory in 1953. So for the last two years of its life, ENIAC was working with that. That's that big white thing in the corner there. But the biggest change from our viewpoint, and one that we discuss extensively in the book, was the new programming system, uh, the converter code that uh, Gene Bartik's group was working out many of the details for. So as you may know, uh, in 1945, and, and we have a chapter in the book on basically the first draft of a report on the EDVAC by John von Neumann. That's a, a central piece of computing history. So von Neumann comes in after ENIAC design is basically over when it's being constructed, and he works with the same team to come up with the design for a successor machine, EDVAC, which, you know, if ENIAC is John the Baptist, then you know, the EDVAC design is Jesus. It's kind of the modern computer architecture. It's the thing that we say, yes, finally, here is you know, the real computer. Um, and, and that's very well known in computing history, although we kind of dig into the archives and try and sort of pin down some controversial questions about who did what. Um, but although people were immediately impressed with this and groups around the world began to build machines along these lines, the problem uh, was that it took a long time to get any of those ready. So none of those machines were doing useful work before 1949. Um, what they realized was they could take this kit of parts that was ENIAC and basically use that to build an ADVAC-like computer. So one of the things that they could build with ENIAC was something where the control, the control was now being done by what we'd recognize as a program, right? not switches and wire, wiring ad hoc control buses, but a series of instructions encoded as numbers. And these were stored on the function tables. Um, all right, sorry, there's a function table. Uh, all right, yeah, these things here. So programming in ENIAC became a matter of dialing the control codes that you wanted for instructions onto those panels there. And to give you an idea of um, how that differs, 
So you know, that's your kind of traditional idea, right? You're, you're configuring it for a job by moving the switches and plugging the wires in. Uh, now, we believe that in March 1948, ENIAC was the first computer to run what we think of as a modern computer program, one encoded as a series of instructions held in an addressable memory where you're doing branching and jumping and so on by jumping to a different memory location. Um, there's a more precise definition of what we mean by the modern code paradigm in the book, but that's the core of it. And uh, the poster, right, so if you want to get the book at the signing, I will throw in this beautiful poster, has got a flow diagram and a sample of code and so on. We spent two chapters in the book talking about that Monte Carlo program, which was run for Los Alamos and simulated an exploding nuclear weapon, a fission, uh, not a fusion device. So this is what ENIAC configurations kind of looked like originally. You basically had two charts. This one would show in parallel what each unit of the machine was doing during each time step of the computation. So you'd design this first, and then you'd figure out, okay, to accomplish that series of operations, how do we have to wire the machine? And this is basically a huge thing. There's not room for it all on the screen. Um, showing all the different panels and how the switches were configured and how you'd have to wire the buses to make that happen. So that was the old way of programming. Now, this is the first draft for an ENIAC configuration that would implement the modern code paradigm and let you switch to our modern system of coded instructions. This was produced in the summer of 1947 by Adele Goldstein, Herman Goldstein's wife, although I'm sure other people's work went into it, but it's her handwriting. Um, Jean Bartik's team and others kind of worked to refine this and came up with you know, the instruction code and exactly how it would be implemented uh, in terms of an ENIAC setup. Um, this is from the logbook that we found that was kept with ENIAC to the end of its life and recorded exactly the configuration of wires and switches that set up this code system. And this is the centerpiece of the poster. So this is the flow diagram. Now, if you think in terms of the first programs we've thought about before, like calculating a table of squares, that kind of thing, you know, they tend to be fairly trivial. And it was really amazing to us that this is the first real program that they tried to run on ENIAC in the new mode, and it's enormously complicated. This is a flow diagram um, drawn up by a team including Nick Metropolis and uh, Clara von Neumann from a kind of basic idea by John von Neumann. Um, simulating the, it's the first Monte Carlo simulation ever run on a computer, as well as the first modern computer program. Um, you, you can't see a whole lot from here, but what you can see is there's a lot of stuff in these boxes. This is not like a trivial 1950s you know, flow diagram, yes, no type thing. Each of these individual boxes has got some rather complicated mathematics in, and they managed to squeeze all that onto ENIAC. Um, we also found in the archives and scanned on the website the handwritten manuscript for a slightly later version of this program run, a few month, run towards the end of 1948. So if you go to the website eniacinaction.com, you can see um, the manuscript, you can see uh, an annotated version of the code for that program. We've also got online something that explains the instructions. So if you want to, you really can dig in with that code. That's a sample of the handwritten thing there. So you'll see it's basically the mnemonic codes here, like 7T, um, 7L, et cetera, turned into numerical, two-digit numerical codes there for each instruction and then entered onto these switches. So for the rest of ENIAC's life, basically, the switches and the, the main switches and wires stay more or less where they are, and you just set up a program that way. All right, so moving to wrap up. Um, operations work, actually working like physically hands-on with the computers, hasn't been talked about a huge amount in computing history, but it's not you know, something that went away after ENIAC. Uh, so in my previous work where I've looked at the history of data processing in large corporations, you kind of see that continuing, right? So here we are, Eckert and Morkley go on from um, ENIAC to create a company that becomes the Univac division. Uh, you've also got the Univac downstairs, it's a beautiful looking machine. That's the first kind of ambitious electronic computer that's sold and they're immediately targeting business as a potential market here. There's a desk and a manager inside a vacuum tube symbolizing what the computer is gonna to bring to business. The fact troller, by the way, interesting that they hadn't come up with the idea of information technology, et cetera, at that point. So they're calling it a fact troller. Uh, 
And remarkably quickly, computers take off in business, actually basically long before anyone's proved you can make any money by using them. There's already thousands of companies um, signed up to get computers and installing them. So by 1962, IBM is finally making more money from its computer products than from its punch card products. And by uh, 1966, we're up to, what, 20,000 computer installations. Um, but as you know, data processing becomes a thing, what you see is operations work is actually still predominating, even though it's not the side of computing history that we talk about so much. So between the women doing the key punching, that's the largest single group of data processing people because punch cards are still the input medium until this is around about the time that people started to do key to disk and so on. So it would drop off pretty rapidly, but up to 71, the biggest group of people working on computers are the women doing the punch card data entry. The operations people working the machines are a quarter, whereas programmers are only 17% of the data processing staff. So you know, operations work continues, and obviously it's changed today, but the sysadmins and the data center administrators and so on you know, is still a very real part of computing. Conclusions, right? Now, there is absolutely and inarguably you know, a serious problem in the tech industry of the underrepresentation of women and kind of the idea that you know, this is not something that girls can aspire to grow up and do. Uh, in this kind of latest issue um, of the uh, core here, uh, you know, there's kind of a feature on that. And Kind of understandably, among the other things that the industry has been trying to do is basically enlist history to provide some inspirational stories um, so that a handful of women become basically kind of figureheads to show you, like, yes, women can and should be in computing. So Ada Lovelace has got a day. Grace Hopper has got a celebration of women in computing. And the women of ENIAC, those first operators, um, have increasingly been kind of become the third leg of this tripod of inspiration and are remembered as the first programmers, right? Because you say, what, you think women can't program? Well, look, here were the first programmers. They were women. Of course women can program. And that's a valuable kind of contribution, but I'm going to argue we've been somewhat like misremembering history uh, in doing some of that. So the Women of ENIAC is a title that I, I think originates in 1996 with an article in Annals of the History of Computing by W. Barclay Fritz, who had worked on ENIAC during its time at BRL. And he did great work kind of tracking down the surviving women, pulling together their memories, you know, getting them to write things, assembled them in an article. Um, Kathy Kleeman at that point began work um, that lasted for some time making a film about the women, and that also helped to bring more attention. There was a 1996 Wall Street Journal column, and there's a great scholarly article from 1999, Jennifer Light's paper, When Computers Were Women. So basically, in the second half of the 90s, the first operators go from being completely forgotten to kind of on a path that's bringing them increasing recognition, um, which has continued to this day. Now, one of the worries I have is that thinking of them as the women of ENIAC, right, and there are their names on a plaque at Penn saying the women of ENIAC, right, the six operators, it seems like that category is being drawn too narrowly, and that kind of ties in with this question of what kind of work do we remember and why? So we're not remembering, as the women of ENIAC, the 50-plus women who actually built the thing. They're not on the plaque. Or Adele Goldstein, who wrote the ENIAC manual and trained and recruited um, the women who were eventually became ENIAC operators to do the human computing work. Or Clara von Neumann, right, whose handwriting is on that manuscript of the first modern computer program ever run. Or the later operators and programmers working on ENIAC at BRL, right? Some of them were men, many of them were women. And to loop back to kind of Walter Isaacson, so one of the interesting things about this media narrative around you know, the women of ENIAC is the idea that they're people who are famous for being forgotten, right? And in the early 90s, they really were forgotten. Um, but according to this NPR piece profiling Walter Isaacson, like two years ago when his book came out, they were still forgotten and Walter Isaacson was rescuing them. Um, and it, here's a line from his book, right? All the engineers who built ENIAC's hardware were men. Now, we know ENIAC was built by women, right? Walter Isaacson didn't know that, but you know, now you do. And also, I mean, engineers don't build computers, right? I mean, engineers you know, design things, and they, 
I, don't, I don't think he actually understands what engineers do. Uh, and then the second half of the statement, all the programmers who created the first general purpose computer were women, right? And that's kind of odd, too, because programmers, you know, don't create computers. Um, but anyway, that's kind of the myth that, is, uh, that we have here, that men designed and built ENIAC, but only women were smart enough to realize that you needed to program the thing. And as we've seen, that's something of an exaggeration, too. But it, you know, it leads to this strange position where you're famous for being forgotten. So, you know, Jim Bartik, here is the computer history fellows. There's the New York Times obituary. There's the movie. There's the museum. So can you be famous and forgotten at the same time? And I think the serious question this leads to us, again, is what kind of work do we remember and why? So history is remembered in a certain way to kind of tie in with this movement for girls who code, which you know, is an important thing to do. And I'm probably in a minority in kind of caring more about history for itself rather than as a means to like, motivate people to do things in the present. But it does mean that we're forgetting this actual history of women who operate. And I say that's more important because if you remember back to that kind of chart I had of work in the data processing department, women would have been doing the key punch work. They'd have been doing some of the computer operating work. They'd have been a fairly small minority of the programmers and the analysts and the data processing managers in most installations. So by remembering um, basically adding a couple of superheroes to you know, the team that historically has been doing all this great stuff and forgetting the kind of ordinary work that women generally actually did, like operations and key punch work, you know, we can't fix what's wrong with this great man view of history just by adding a few token great women like Grace Hopper and Jean Bartik. Right? This whole insistence on innovation as genius and individual breakthroughs, et cetera, just structurally prevents us from understanding and recognizing the kind of historical work that women actually were allowed to do. Right? So there's also kind of a mixture of class and gender here, because by the 50s, computer operations and key punch work was seen as kind of blue-collar, shift-based work, um, not coincidentally also the work most likely to be done by women, versus programming, more of a white-collar job sitting in a cubicle with a code pad. And as Wendy uh, Hui Kong Chun has noted, reclaiming these women as the first programmers glosses over the hierarchies among operators, coders, and analysts. Um, now we see this is Walter Isaacson again at the groundbreaking of the Pennovation Center uh, in 2014, right? So this pen itself, its own website, put out a press release saying six women PhD students, right? No, they weren't students. They didn't have PhDs. They had undergrad degrees, some of them in mathematics, some not. But, you know, they were working doing the hands-on labor of computation, were tasked with programming the machine, a simplification, but when the computer was unveiled to the public on Valentine's Day, right, they're not even getting the date right. Um, and, you know, to tie in with something that's kind of in the present day, uh, so, you know, cloud computing, right? It's obviously a different thing, but you have this same kind of idea of, you know, the cloud, that it's a metaphor that's hiding from view the actual physical infrastructure and challenges and labor of computing. In the same kind of way that this focus on genius, conceptual breakthroughs, and programming has hidden the historical reality of early computing and its different forms of work from view. Now, innovation, right, obviously a buzzword, one of the most powerful words out there at the moment, um, very much associated with science, progress, and particularly the future, right, not so much with history, Silicon Valley, billionaires, right, and the problem that people in my line of work have is that history, by definition, is about the past, not the future. Uh, as uh, Vinod Kolsas said earlier this year, if subjects like history and literature are focused on too early, it's easy for someone not to learn to think for themselves and not to question assumptions, conclusions, and expert philosophies. This can do a lot of damage, right? So there's an idea that history actually can you know, hurt people from thinking innovatively. Um, in response to that kind of line of thinking, uh, one of my friends, uh, Andrew Russell, um, made an ironic proposal that what we need is a book to counter Isaacson called The Maintainers. Right? He's a specialist on internet history. Um, so he knows how the internet was really created. How a group of bureaucrats, standard engineers, and introverts made digital infrastructures that kind of work most of the time. And this actually led to a very successful conference and a kind of movement, right? Keeping technology working at least some of the time, the maintainers. Um, so that's kind of one hopeful, perhaps, kind of way of countering those lines of thinking. Um, uh, some closing thoughts, right? So history matters, and I hope that's not a hard sell here, even if it might be in the rest of the valley even though IT has always been focused on the future. 
There's more to history than firsts and lone geniuses. Don't believe Hollywood. Um, successful IT innovation has always depended on execution, operations, logistics, and doing the little things well, right? The wires, the power supplies, having the machine not catch fire, the air conditioning, all those kinds of things that we came across. So what you know, can we generalize from this historically grounded understanding of the ENIAC story that might give us a different sense of what innovation actually is from you know, the popular narratives? I'd say ENIAC is the story of smart, right, to very smart. I mean, were they geniuses? You know, what does that mean anyway? The point is, you know, they were smart enough. Hardworking, you know, too obsessive. Um, they, you certainly get a sense of that from the archives. Uh, flawed. Men and women who came together to do many kinds of work more or less cooperatively. Now, the book also kind of discusses the aftermath of this and some of the legal proceedings that lead them to be testifying against each other in lawsuits for the next 30 years. But at the time, they were working together pretty well. Um, they were in the right places at the right time, supported by bigger institutions, right? The US government, um, BRL, the Moore School. Uh, they did their jobs well enough in challenging times. Even without superpowers, they changed the world. You know, and if there's one thing I'd want you to take away from uh, the book and the talk, I think it would be the idea that that's something that all these different kinds of work added up to. Even the secretary and the drafts women and those wire women whose names have been forgotten. Thank you. Uh, find out more at my personal website, tomandmaria.com slash tom, and at the project website, www.eniacinaction.com. <laughs> Thank you very much for that. That was uh, excellent and amazing, as always. Um, so we're going to start with uh, questions that we've taken uh, from the audience. Um, so the first question I have is, uh, what was the rationale for using decimal rather than binary arithmetic in the ENIAC? Hmm. Well, it's certainly true um, binary number representation um, I think was something that would have been familiar to the project team. Um, it goes down into kind of the fundamental structure of, of how ENIAC worked. So the individual units that had the electronic memory in were called accumulators, and each had 10 digits in. And as the name suggests, and this was by reference to accumulators in conventional adding machines, as well as storing, they also added. So there wasn't like a single adder circuit, you know, as in a, a modern computer architecture. Each accumulator was also adding. So it basically was a ring, and each digit could have 10 different stable positions. When it had gone all the way down, it carried to the next digit. So I think they did that because they were confident that they could build those circuits in a familiar kind of way. Um, and also being decimal internally uh, would simplify the work of input and output. Hmm. Um, oh, interesting. So. I, I guess, um, so the next question has to do with the sort of the parallel architecture of the ENIAC. Um, so it asks, were the programming wires carrying serial data or were, were multiple wires parallel? Um, <clears throat> well, each unit um, output onto two different buses, the data bus and the programming bus. And the programming code signal was just a pulse. So the only thing that that said was go. Now, what happens when that pulse is received would depend on what, what unit it goes to, which input terminal, and how the switches have been set on it. So if you take that pulse over to the multiplier, it could start a multiplication. If you take it over to another accumulator, it could do another addition. If you take it over to the master programmer, the pulse could be saying, we're finished with this loop. It's time to step another iteration of the cycle. So in that sense, I think the questioner is imagining that the program pulse system is much more complicated than it is. Um, and it's, in fact, that kind of unique, basically wiring a data flow and a control flow for each problem that uh, characterizes the ENIAC architecture. It's also, by the way, where the word program comes from. 
Um, so this is something I talked about in another CICM column. Uh, the idea of programming the computer context is something that comes out of ENIAC, but it doesn't mean what you think it would. Um, if you think about a program in other contexts, like a degree program, um, or a lecture program, um, or uh, even a, a washing machine program, what you're basically talking about is selecting and sequencing operations and carrying them out in an order. So on the ENIAC, the master programmer, that sounds like a job title, but it wasn't, it was a machine. And that was the, the, the thing that was carrying out the nested loops and sending the pulses to the, the program pulses. So programmer didn't mean the person who was doing the configurations. It actually described the action that takes place when one piece of machinery sends a control signal to make another piece of machinery do something. Hmm. It's fascinating. Um, how fast did the ENIAC run? What how, how many ads could it do per second? What was its clock speed? Um, well, yeah, the figure that I quoted there um, was the 300 multiplications, because a job that's complicated enough to need this is probably going to have the overall throughput governed by multiplications. Um, in terms of additions, ENIAC is generally quoted as having a clock speed of 100 kilohertz. Now, what we found was when they tried to run that fast, it didn't work. Um, and eventually they came to grips with that. So they turn it up to 100 kilohertz to the start of the week to shake out any problems and then turn it down and it would run more reliably around about 70. Um, it took 20 clock pulses to do an addition. So if it was running flat out, then I guess that's 50,000 additions. Um, but of course, the accumulators could work in parallel. So um, more than one of the accumulators could be working away doing an addition at the time. Wow. Um, Sorry, 5,000 additions. Ah, 5,000. So zero there. <laughs> OK. We have a question about um, the production of VNIAC. And I guess this is probably also about maintenance. Um, sort of it, it asks, um, how many of any one thing did they build? So was there redundancy? Um, you know, in terms of the units <laughs> or in terms of the parts that they used? Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, it was delivered with a full set of spare parts. So, in fact, that saved them with the power supplies. So, they placed the order for what they thought would be the, the production power supplies with the flight by night company that never delivered. They placed the backup order at a much lower rate with a company that was allowed to take longer to produce them. In the end, the backup power supplies were ready before the primary ones. So, that was a fortunate result of the contractual provision that they had to supply ENIAC with sufficient spares of everything. Um, the thing that they would have most of in terms of a plug-in unit would be the digits. So across the 20 accumulators, um, there were 200 decimal digits, and each digit was a pull-out tray um, and some spares. I don't know exactly how many, but I, I guess they'd have at least 20 spares. Because um, the idea was you get a fault, you pull out the whole unit, you plug in a new one, and then you can figure out at leisure what's gone wrong in the unit that you swapped out. So there are lots of smart kind of modular engineering techniques that went into the machine. Fascinating. So when a, a vacuum tube burnt out, they would take the whole decimal digit out and, and put in a new one, and then they would test the yeah. tubes individually later. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly true. Um, they took 23 tubes to represent um, one decimal digit. So uh, it could take them a while to figure out exactly where the problem was. Mm -hmm. They had some special purpose tube testing stations built as well. Right. One of, you know, one of the interesting things that, you know, the traditional history of the ENIAC and, you know, the story that we tell here at the museum is about the unreliability of the vacuum tubes. And, of course, you know, your book reveals that a lot of other things were, were, were unreliable as well. Yes. Exactly how unreliable were the vacuum tubes? Were they more reliable than is, has popularly been understood, or? Hmm. Well, as we saw, the machine reliability peaked about 75% of the time being spent on useful production. Um, it's certainly true that when they stopped turning it off at night, or rather, um, vacuum tubes had separate heater inputs, and the heater inputs they kept on because it was when the tubes were warming down we were warming up and cooling down that the failures uh, predominantly happened. 
So I, I certainly think with the kind of techniques that people have written about previously, like famously, they were running the tubes only at a small fraction of the rated current, which they realized would make them a lot more reliable. Um, it's in, also important to realize that over the time span we're talking about, vacuum tubes changed. So within a few years, um, they were basically doing digital things with tubes that had been designed to work in analog ways. With the explosion in digital electronics after the war, tube manufacturers start producing tubes that are designed to have high reliability for these new kinds of applications. So in fact, a particular tube that was nicknamed the computer tube because it was designed specifically for these kinds of applications. So by the end of ENIAC's life in 1955, um, I think the tubes themselves would be substantially more reliable for this kind of application than they would have been a decade earlier. Hmm. Wow. The next question is about prop intellectual property uh, rights. Um, so maybe could you, you could discuss um, von Neumann's role as a, quote, spoiler, and also the Honeywell court case. Um, yeah. Well, von Neumann um, comes along in uh, the summer of 1944 and works with the team to shape their ideas about the successor machine, um, the EDVAC. Um, and von Neumann's first draft of report on the EDVAC, which is ready by the end of April 1945, is the first statement of many things that we think of as kind of the modern computer architecture. So the idea that you have an addressable memory that's holding code and data um, in the same kind of memory cells, almost interchangeably in the original draft, um, and that you have a small number of instructions that are used to manipulate both code and data, and that you have a program counter and all those kinds of things. Now, um, Hermann Goldstein, who is uh, becoming von Neumann's sidekick basically at this point, um, receives a, a, a draft manuscript from von Neumann and is very kind of excited by this and makes a number of copies and sends them out. And this is later judged to be a publication of the first, of the, basically the core ideas behind what we think of as like modern computer architecture. So there's some discussion um, over the next few years of who gets to patent this. And the answer is nobody. <laughs> <laughs> because you had an open publication that took place a year before anyone filed an application for it. On the other hand, the ENIAC ideas produced before von Neumann comes along um, were, were kept secret long enough to file a patent on it, which eventually is granted. And that's kind of seen as a patent on kind of the basic ideas of a digital computer. Um, and the, we talk in the book about this kind of huge court case that goes with this. And it's really distorted historical memory um, because all the people involved in ENIAC are, are drilled by lawyers and deposed repeatedly and sign affidavits, not just in the kind of famous case that comes to its conclusion in the early 70s, but in challenges to the patents and interference proceedings and other kinds of lawsuits. So before anyone is caring about computer history to get people together and do oral histories and like write about it, they've all been through these decades of lawsuits. And what you see in the early writing on computer history is that basically people are continuing to advance the same positions that they'd held as expert witnesses in the early historical writing, <clears throat> which is, I think, one reason why many topics in early ENIAC history have been so contentious. One of those, of course, is the question of whether von Neumann just so moving from ENIAC back to EDVAC now, and the first draft report with the ideas there, um, Eckert and Morkley bas later basically claimed that all those ideas were theirs and von Neumann stole them um, uh, and put his name on them. And um, we did what we could in terms of digging into the archival materials. And our, our best sense of how the credit for that ought to be divided up is basically, if you kind of go from a bottom-up hardware engineering viewpoint, the kind of basic ideas of adders and multipliers and a large memory. So Eckert also came up with the idea for a delay line memory, which was the first practical um, way of producing a large addressable, writable as well as readable memory. And it doesn't make any sense to think of storing program instructions in the same memory as data until you have a big addressable memory. If you were building it out of vacuum tubes the same way ENIAC did, you'd be a lunatic to think that you would 
put instructions in that memory. It wouldn't make any sense. So only after you have a large memory that you could put the instructions and data in does that kind of architectural innovation make sense. So we think it's certainly something they thought with, but our best sense is that they'd thrown a bunch of ideas in the air, and von Neumann basically kind of selected from those and integrated them. But certainly, he seems to have been responsible for the uh, instruction code and the idea of a small number of instructions and so on. Because we saw, for example, in the engineering meeting notes um, from the team that was working on NFAC not long before he came up with the report, they still hadn't decided whether um, the code memory and data memory should be segregated or kept together. They were still kind of discussing the options. They hadn't decided if it needed to have just one adder and multiplier or if it should have many. So the kind of very stark minimalist design that was so influential in the first draft of you know, a very small instruction set, a very simple architecture, reuse of all the same capabilities for code and data. They may have mentioned those things, but I think they certainly hadn't committed to them. And von Neumann put them all together and kind of in a particular way and worked out the implications. Um, that's at least our sense in, in the story. We, but we're very much aware that there are holes in the archival record that mean that there's always going to be a lot of supposition and conjecture around this question of who did what in terms of coming up with those ideas between von Neumann and Eckert and Morkley and the other engineers on the Penn team. Hmm. Thank you. Fascinating. Um, the next question is about validating the program before it was actually put into the ENIAC. So were there people who would validate the instructions prior to actually using them on the ENIAC? And I think this is probably refers to after it was converted to the um, architecture. Although I guess you could talk about it in terms of both how it was done before and after. Yes. Well, <clears throat> we did certainly um, see evidence in planning this Monte Carlo program. So there wasn't just one flow diagram. We found over a period of many months a kind of a succession of draft flow diagrams before they got to the stage of having a complete one and turning that into code. So that certainly meant that they were thinking through in great detail what was going to happen. And it was also fascinating to watch them get in grips with basically these kind of central features of, of what we think of as a program. So some things that originally in the first draft they did less efficiently, they realized that they could use a loop for, combined with a lookup table, for example. Um, and that's kind of a learning process that probably many of us have gone through learning to program. But you know, in a sense, that it was happening you know, for the very first time kind of here. They were working those things through. So, I mean, back in the days um, before there were interactive terminals, there was obviously way more desk checking and thought went into a program before it was executed than would be the case today. I think in that sense, this was an extreme case of it. Um, we also saw on that manuscript of the uh, Monte Carlo simulations for Los Alamos that Clara von Neumann had written, um, there were some extra digits kind of in the column on the right. And what that was, was you could see she was hand tracing through, simulating what should be happening with the contents of the accumulators and comparing that with what ENIAC was actually doing. Now, we don't know, was that hand traced before she ran the program? Was it like when the machine was doing something that she wasn't expecting? But that's certainly evidence for a process of kind of simulated hand tracing. And in fact, that was helpful to us. Uh, my collaborator, Mark Priestley, produced an ENIAC emulator and set up on that the wires and switches that for the conversion, and then set up on the function table the code that we had. And because she'd hand traced a part of it, we're able to actually follow it through and see that, yes, it does do exactly what we would expect from those digits there. The interesting thing, by the way, uh, you might think, OK, Los Alamos simulation code, you know, maybe it should be secret. And I mean, there's a bunch of stuff at Los Alamos that we can't get to. But this was their copy from Princeton where they were working. And it went in the National Archives. And I think partly no one ever realized what it was. Um, but the other thing was, one of the function tables held all the physics cross-sections. So there's data that you basically can't get without doing an awful lot of experimental work that's very hard to do. And the interesting was, the code for the simulation, they didn't particularly protect. The numerical constants for the nuclear cross-sections, they protected very carefully. So in the archives, there's slips of Clara von Neumann signing that she's received these from her husband 
and given them back again at the end of the run. Um, there's an expense form saying that she has to have a private sleeper car so no one will see them while she's on the train down to get there and so on. So it was actually the physics constant data that they were really keen on protecting rather than the algorithms for the uh, nuclear car, uh, for the nuclear Monte Carlo simulation. Wow, that's fascinating. <laughs> so having those, having those examples there on the manuscript from working through were the only way we could make any sense of it because of course we didn't have the top secret cross-section data that they'd been using. That, that leads very naturally to our next question, which is, um, were there any accounts of espionage of the ENIAC, any computer spies? Um, not that I'm aware of. Uh, as I said, I mean, within the, at least kind of the military industrial complex, it was a fairly open secret even when they were building it. Uh, they had to get um, permission to declassify the basics of the machine before they could do the press conference. And a, few, a little bit later after that, they declassified the details. But basically, everything you could possibly want to know about ENIAC hardware was in the manuals that were issued in 1946. And they went in university libraries. Hmm. So some of the applications run on ENIAC certainly would have sensitive details. But the machine itself was not, was not kept secret. And that, of course, is a, uh, a contrast with Colossus, which I'm working on now, which was um, kept very secret. And it's only in the last few years that we've really understood exactly the details of how that worked and what it could do. Hmm. Is it fair to say that ballistics calculation was the first killer app? Uh, or was it? Well, yeah, ab simulation? absolutely, because the term killer app is way overused. But if you look at least at like Cringely's description of what it meant in um, Accidental Empires, it had a very precise definition of a single application that's so compelling that you'll buy an entire computer platform just to run it. Mm. Um, and of course, that fitted with his examples of VisiCalc and PageMaker, mm. uh, respectively for the Apple II and the Mac Plus. Um, so in that very literal sense, absolutely, I mean, it's incontrovertible. They bought the entire platform to run one application. <laughs> now, the designers of, uh, or at least they, they justified, you know, up the chain of command that that's what it was for. Now, uh, BRL put together a committee to work on different applications before the machine was finished. And Eckert and Morkley and other engineers built a lot of flexibility into it but it was sold and paid for on the basis of one application, which is the textbook example of a killer app. Right. There are many other different applications that were run on the ENIAC, um, and there were also many times where the ENIAC had to be shut down for repairs. Um, the next question asks, when the ENIAC was shut down, what program or programs was it running? Um, Well, I'm going to understand that be a question about debugging and diagnostics. Is that what you think the question's about? I think it's about what job, like what application uh, was, was the ENIAC running at the point where it shut down for several months. You mean before they moved it? Uh, you know, I'm going to go with the debugging uh, uh, right. side of it. So um, one of the smart things they did um, the function tables right, had thousands of digits that could be used to store constants or instructions. Um, they also had a switch. So you could switch the machine over to take its instructions one at a time from the card reader. So that basically means no looping, um, but more flexibility. So when they were having problems with it, they'd flip the switch, they'd leave everything set up like it was, and they'd go over to card control and run the diagnostics decks, which would exercise every piece of the equipment and they look at the output and figure out what had broken. Then when they fixed it, they put the switch back, and everything they were running is still set up there, and it's ready to go with the next step. Hmm. Well, so I guess this is a related question. So during a breakpoint, what was the state of the computer? Um, well, when ENIAC was working, it was potentially a very good machine for debugging, because the accumulators um, each one of them held 10 digits. And there was a matrix of little neon lights on the front of the accumulator. You've got 10 digits across. You've got 10 values up and down. So one light is going to be illuminated in each column. So you can look at a glance at the front of the machine and see the contents of every piece of memory. 
Now, if you look at the machines in the collection, you kind of see that evolving. But in later machines where you've got more memory locations, you've got lights, you need to kind of switch up and down the monitor lights to different words of memory. But ENIAC had got a small enough memory, you could just have a light for every possible value. <laughs> um, so you'd be able to see at a glance um, what was in each of the accumulators. By the way, they, they also famously, when a movie crew came along, the lights were hard to read, so they cut ping pong balls in half uh, and wrote numbers on the front so that numbers would glow and be picked up by the camera. And if you look at the ENIAC video uh, that's online, you'll see that. Another fun thing I've been thinking with this, ENIAC Pong, I think it's totally doable. You take five accumulators to make the playing field. Uh, you could use the uh, function table switches to move the paddle up and down. And the little neon is going to be the ball that's going backwards and forwards. Uh, and then the rest of the accumulators will be more than enough to store the working data for the trajectory. <laughs> <laughs> so in the book, you, t you, you trace the history of the the term stored program computer or stored program concept. And you talk about how that term uh, really represents three different ideas. Could you explain that? Oh, yeah. So this kind of goes with the, um, the way the history has previously been understood. So um, people call this kind of EDVAC-like computer the one that you know, has checks all the boxes and is the Jesus rather than John the Baptist, you know, from which all the subsequent computers evolve. It's generally called the stored program computer. And that is drawing attention to one particular feature, that the program is stored in a writable memory. And people often say, yeah, the same writable memory that the data is stored in. And that's certainly one of the important features that's there in the first draft. But it's also led, basically, in my view, to this kind of morass of of arguments that can never be resolved because different people have talked about stored program computer and they've meant different things. Some people literally just mean this one characteristic and other people mean this kind of whole constellation of ideas that were there with the EDVAC. And so this argument about why the stored program computer was so complicated uh, and also this question of, well, which I, in a, in a way, I was drawn into this by not wanting to have to say was or wasn't ENIAC the first stored program computer? Because in a sense, ENIAC was the first machine to be up and running with some of these crucial ideas from the EDVAC report, right? Like the instruction set and the branching and the program controller, but it didn't have all of them. In particular, because you were storing the code and the data by turning switches on a panel, it wasn't possible for the program to modify its own code as it ran. And some people have said that self-modifying code is the key characteristic of the stored program computer. But then you can argue about things like, so why doesn't the EDVAC report itself allow self-modifying code? Von Neumann actually said, we'll have a little flag. And if, it's, if, a bit, if, a, if a word is flagged as being program code, we don't let you overwrite it. We let you modify the address, but not the opcode part of it. So it would be kind of odd to say that the first draft of the report for the EDVAC doesn't describe a stored program computer, et cetera. So I could talk for hours about all that. But the point is, we decided that it was like the first computer, an argument that just completely consisted of how you define computer. So we said, let's forget about stored program computer and split the key ideas from the first draft of the report on the EDVAC that people rush off to Manchester and Cambridge and um, Princeton and other places to build computers based on um, after 1945. Let's split it into three things that are precisely defined. So we had the um, EDVAC hardware paradigm that is the idea of a binary machine, um, bit serial, um, more generally serial in the sense that we understand it today as well. You know, one multiplier, one adder, kind of minimal, all electronic. Um, another idea is what you'd call the von Neumann architecture. Um, and that's a term that I think has been relatively well understood. Um, so I wouldn't need to define everything about that, but you know, it's to do with, uh, again, this kind of particularly this kind of extreme serial um, approach and the program counter and so on. And the third thing is what we call the modern code paradigm. So that's the idea of a machine that's got a small number of instructions that consist of an opcode and also arguments um, that are by default executed serially, but you can have a jump instruction that jumps out of order and so on. 
And what we'd say basically is ENIAC is the first machine to run code written in the modern code paradigm. There is no functional difference between ENIAC code and code for any other modern early computer in terms of what it could do. Um, there's a difference in terms of how you would go about um, changing the destination of a jump. In another early computer, you might do it by code modification. ENIAC did it by indirect addressing because it would just store the location that you jump to in memory. But it has the same functional effect. You can change the destination of the jump. Um, in terms of the uh, EDVAC hardware paradigm, clearly ENIAC doesn't do that. It's still enormously big and inefficient and quirky, um, which is one reason why nobody, it's not you know, huge news at the time, because people already know, you know, they already knew what they wanted to build. They were already confident that the EDVAC approach would work. The fact that ENIAC had been like retrofitted to run the modern code didn't really kind of have a huge effect on the world. It's, it did just happen to be the first time that, that code had been run, though. And uh, the von Neumann architecture, I think you could say that it's essentially overlaid on the ENIAC architecture. So you're setting up those switches and pathways basically to emulate the von Neumann architecture, even though there's still all the ENIAC stuff underneath. And the result of that is that most of the, the ports and the switch settings on ENIAC are never used after that. It's like there's huge chunks of the machine that just, you know, are never going to be used again ever because it's been wired to do this one specific thing. Thank you very much, and we're out of time. Thank you uh, for joining us. And as a reminder, um, Dr. Haig will be signing books um, outside in the foyer. Yeah, and giving away posters. <laughs> Thanks.